Happy Sunday, everybody. At least um, what's left of this Sunday. <laughs> it's pretty late, but I'm going to try and get this video done. Um, this is Tracy here to review part three of the Yanla Fix My Life, Fix a Black Man's Broken Heart series. And this is the final installment um, of that series. And I actually, I think that it may be the... Um, the end of the season for um, Young Love Fix My Life because I believe this was like the 10th episode for this season. I must say I was a little let down by this episode and just wondering did anybody else feel like this whole, you know, the ending was kind of anticlimactic. Um, it just seemed, I don't know, I guess I was expecting more. But anyway, let's get going uh, with the review. So this episode started out pretty much the same way the other two episodes started and ended, you know, with Terrence saying that he's getting ready to leave. Um, this was a carryover from the conversation that him and Iyanla was having on um, part two when it ended, where he was telling Iyanla that he didn't want to leave the house, but he had to because of his wife. And so we learned in this episode that, um, Terrence is probably a male victim of domestic violence. Um, he was talking to Iyanla, you know, about his eye and how he feels unattractive. He wears the glasses because he feels really unattractive with the glasses are off. So he takes the glasses off for Iyanla, you know, and she's telling him, you know, she still thinks he's a very handsome man. And then she asks him, um, you know, who did that to his eye? So I'm thinking like maybe he was stabbed in the eye or something. And Although they beep it out, it's very clear that he said to Iyala that his wife um, is the one that um, did whatever was done to his eye, that, you know, now he's blind in that one eye. And then, you know, Iyala asked him to confirm, you know, that Blake did it. And But like I said, you could tell that they were saying that it was the wife that um, actually had did it. So, you know, Iyala doesn't um, beg him to stay. She doesn't even ask him to stay. But she does let him know that even though he didn't complete the course with everybody else, that he wasn't a failure and that, you know, he had gone as far as it was meant for him to go um, in this sitting and that, you know, he needs to take whatever it was that he learned with him. And so when um, Iyanla got ready to leave, you know, she told him that they had made arrangements for him to go and he gave her a hug and it was like really emotional and heartfelt and you can tell that he wanted to hold on to Iyala, you know, for dear life, like she was a lifesaver. But he had promised his wife, you know, that he was going to leave the house. And so I think it was more important to him to honor that commitment than honoring the commitment of trying to um, get help that was being offered to him so that he could um, lead a better life. And I also want to add that I, I was kind of disappointed. Like, I think all along we knew that there was some kind of mental abuse going on between Terrence and the wife. But then once he pointed out that the wife was the one that had damaged his eye, I was like, you know, this was a perfect opportunity for Iyala to address domestic violence and that, you know, sometimes men are victims of domestic violence, but she let the opportunity pass. And I don't know if maybe, you know, she was thinking she can get Terrence and Jennifer on, you know, on another episode or next season where they can address their issues or if she just thought it was just too complicated to get into and so she didn't want to deal with it. But um, I just really think that there probably was somebody sitting at home watching this show who was probably in the same seat that Terrence is in who really needed them to speak on the whole domestic violence issue and that, you know, own and Iyala, they totally missed the mark and missed the opportunity to have helped someone that may have been in their viewing audience um, with this subject. So after Iyala leaves the room, you know, Terrence, he takes off his microphone and everything and then he calls his wife and he lets his wife know that, you know, he is on his way home and that he did, um, let Iyala know, you know, that he couldn't stay. And then he was telling her that, you know, he was really enjoying being in the house and, you know, being around the other guys and he was learning a lot. And she kind of flipped the script on him and was like, oh, are you trying to manipulate me? Are you trying to say, you know, it's my fault that you're leaving and, you know, this is what you always do. And so it's just like these mind games and these mind tricks and, I'm just thinking it has got to be hell in that house, you know, that they're living in. And 
as a woman, I could, there is no way in the world I could be in a relationship with a man, number one, who was that submissive and did whatever I told him to do. And there's no way I would be in a relationship with a man that, you know, would allow me to, um, you know, to be abusive to him, both verbally, mentally, physically abusive to him. I just, I would hate myself and not feel good about myself. So I know as an abuser, she probably has some, you know, deep issues that she's dealing with, but I'm just thinking, you know, on the surface, on the outside, looking in, this is just pure chaos and craziness. And there's just no way I could live my life. I wouldn't even want a man that would allow me to dominate him like that. So once the scene with Terrence and Iyanla ends, um, the show kind of moves um, fast. And it kind of made me think that, you know, maybe a lot of the parts that we may have wanted to see ended up on the um, editing floor because it just, like after that scene, it was just like, okay, let's get this over with. There was nothing really happening. You know, Yanla, she calls the other guys in and she lets them know that um, Terrence has left the house, you know, but they want to still honor him. And, you know, and she basically says the same thing to them that she said to Terrence that, you know, he didn't fail but he had gone as far as, you know, like the universe intended for him to go at this particular time in his life. And so, you know, the guys were like, okay. And then she went around the room and, you know, was asking them how did they feel about it. And so, you know, the guys were giving their opinions, you know, on what they thought of Terrence leaving the house. Oh, and one other good thing that um, I like that Iyanla said was, she said, you know, the whole thing with Terrence is that you can't, heal what you're not willing to face. And of course, you know, we know that um, Terrence was, he had a lot of things buried deep inside of him that he wasn't uh, willing to accept or acknowledge was going on until it was like really too late. And he had already told the wife that he was going to come home. So Yala tells the guys that, you know, men are raised to tolerate the pain that they're feeling and that they're never allowed to express it. But, you know, it's time to move away from that old way of thinking and that, you know, in order for them to get better, they've got to be able to acknowledge when they are in pain and face that pain and deal with it. So as she's um, talking to the guys, you know, she kind of goes around the room and she's asking each one of them, you know, how did they see the situation with Terrence and how did they, um, you know, see themselves in that situation. And so she, I remember one of the things where she was talking to Mike from boys to men and she was getting him to understand that he was being deceitful and dishonest when he had, you know, gotten the phone for the kids and was sneaking and calling and talking to the kids. And he was like, well, you know, that's what I had to do in order to maintain a relationship with my kids. And, you know, because my wife, and so he was blaming the wife and then Yala was trying to get him to understand, like, no, you were teaching your kids how to lie, how to be deceitful. And then she broke it down and was like, you know, so you basically taught your daughter that if she has a boyfriend that, you know, she doesn't want the mom to know about, that she can hide it and she can lie and sneak behind the mom's back. And, you know, you're teaching your, your sons that if they do something wrong, you know, it's okay, you know, because we can just keep it from mom and do things behind her back. So, you know, once she put it in that perspective, he kind of understood how his actions, even though in his desperation, he felt that was the only way he can, um, keep a relationship with his kids that still was wrong. So then Iyanla um, passed out, you know how she does the labels where they're taped to their t-shirts. And so she passed out new labels. And so Mike, I think it was Michael Angelo, um, his new label was worthy. Mike Bass was important. Tyrone was a leader. Um, Clarence was responsible. Kevin was confident. And then they pulled one out for Terrence. And that one was um, courageous. So then Iyanla brings out Kevin's mom. And, I, you know, it took me back to what she said in episode two about, you know, a man is who his mother makes him. And so the conversation with the mom, you know, it was so telling about the childhood that he had. And so we learned that she was very violent. You know, she was a violent woman and she basically taught him to be violent because, you know, that's the issue that he's dealing with. And so, you know, she's distant, so that makes him distant. And, you know, she doesn't deal with her issues. And I think at one point she tells Kevin that, like, she didn't get professional help, but she did um, 
read books and study, you know, go online and research, you know, how to deal with her anger issues. So I guess she's like taught herself how to um, be less controlling and less violent. And then we learned that when Kevin was nine years old, the parents were arguing and the mother threw a knife. And so Kevin grew up thinking that the mother was throwing the knife at the father and that the knife almost hit him. And then the mom was like, no, I was throwing the knife at the door because if I wanted to uh, have stabbed your dad, I would have, you know, hit him with the knife. And so um, Yala, you know, just trying to get her to understand that he was, you know, Kevin was nine years old when that happened. And so imagine the fear that he must have felt that his mom, you know, is throwing a knife trying to hurt somebody. And so as Yala was trying to get the mom to understand the role that she played in how Kevin is so angry and acting out, Kevin was sitting there and he had this smirk on his face like a little child, like he was happy that, you know, Yala was reprimanding his mom. And I thought that was kind of creepy. And then you could see the other guys like in the background. And I think Clarence was looking like, you know, what the hell is going on here? And then Mike Bass, I don't know if he was praying or what, but, you know, he kept closing his eyes. And so I just thought it was interesting how some of the guys seemed really disconnected, unconcerned. And I think Clarence was the only one that was like really paying attention um, to the conversation. And so as they went on talking, we learned that at some point the mom had placed a restraining order against Kevin because she said she feared him. And then, you know, Yala kind of brought it back around to, you know, when he was nine, he feared her. And so now she fears him. And it's the it's basically the same thing. And so they talked it out. And then Kevin, I think, finally told the mom, you know, how he was afraid growing up, you know, and how fearful he was and stuff. And so they came to somewhat of a resolution, you know, and they hugged and he told her that he really loved her. And in that moment, he just seemed like that kid that just always wanted his mom's love and wanted to show his mom, you know, that he loved her. So I thought that was, um, I thought that was a good look, you know, but I still was kind of concerned about, you know, how he was looking when the mom, you know, when Yala was getting on the mom about her behavior. And so that kind of like made me think that maybe it's not clicking in his head after all. So next we had the guys, um, Yala took them outside and they were going to do an exercise. So you remember in the first part, they did the thing where they had to get over the electrical fence. Well, this time it's like a really tall, maybe, um, maybe like a 10 foot wall, 11 foot wall. And the goal was for them to everybody to get over the wall and onto a platform without using a rope. And so um, Michelangelo, if you remember when they were doing the electrical fence exercise, he like freaked out and was saying that, you know, he couldn't do anything physical. And so I, I guess I missed part of it in the first episode or maybe it was edited out. But the reason he doesn't want to do anything physical is because he has a bad back. And so he didn't want to hurt his back. So he starts off this exercise by telling the guys he wants to go first, but he really needs them to support him and help him get up. And so what he's going to do is run up to them and then they were going to hoist him up and then he would, you know, reach up and go over the wall. And so everybody gets over the wall. I think Kevin was the last one and he basically like um, ran and kind of leaped up the wall and then the guys had to um, catch him and then they kind of like pulled him over the wall. And so, you know, after they did that, you know, they got into the circle and it kind of reminded me of the, um, oh my God, I can't think of what island. Is it the Netherlands? Of the Samoans, it's some island, um, some island where the, the guys they do that like ceremonial ritual. I can't think of the name of it, but um, anyway, so they were doing something like that, you know, where they were cheering and rooting each on each other on after um, they all made it over to, over the wall. So the show ended with um, they did a rite of passage ceremony. And so this took up like probably the last 15 minutes of the show. Like I said, there was really nothing much going on. And another one of the, I think Terrence took up so much time of the show that we really didn't get to learn much about the other guys. And I couldn't even figure out, you know, when we got to the end of the show, why Michelangelo or um, Tyrone was even on the show because they had so little interaction or parts on the show that they probably could have edited them out the whole uh, three-part episode and we wouldn't even miss them at all. 
And so um, at the rite of passage, she brings in three elders, you know, that are going to, um, you know, do the ceremony with the guys. And it was um, the actor, Louis Gossett Jr., um, spiritual minister, Michael Beckwith, who I think he has some church, it's like alternative religion type church in California. And he used to be on Oprah's talk show all the time. And then there was another guy who was a spiritual advisor. His name was Eduardo Reed. I had never um, heard of him before, but I had heard of the other two. And so before the ceremony, the guys came downstairs to meet with Iyanla. And they all were dressed in all white, you know, white tops, um, white pants. And I think they took their shoes off and they had on white socks or something. And so she gave each one of them the opportunity, you know, to talk about what they learned since they'd been in the house. And then these other guys came and they um, blindfolded them with these um, blue scarves tied around their heads. And then they led them outside to where the ceremony was going to take place. And there were some, you know, like drummers doing like an African beat and everything. And then they sat the guys down. And so one thing um, I noticed Yala did throughout the show, even though Terrence had left, she included him in everything. So like when she gave the guys the new names, they, was, they were able to pull one for Terrence. When they went outside to climb the wall, um, they, she had gave them gloves. And so there were a pair of gloves that she laid down, you know, at the base of the wall, you know, to represent Terrence. And then when they got outside to do the ceremony, there was a chair that was turned. Um, so it was a chair and the chair was covered up. And then for some reason, she went and uncovered the chair and then turned the chair upside down. So I don't understand what the sim symbolism of that was all about. But, you know, she wanted Terrence to be in spirit, to still be a part of the ceremony. So the first part of the rites of passage was each one of the guys had the opportunity to stand up and show their gratitude for Yanla, you know, for accepting them into the house and for working with them and giving them a fresh outlook and a fresh start on their life. And so that was kind of emotional because I think anytime somebody is grateful for what you're doing, um, you know, you know, you've made a difference regardless of what happens after that point, at least they were able to recognize that you did something great for them. And so the next part was a renaming ceremony. And Iyala said that um, the name of a man is his soul and his sword. And so it's important that they have um, names, I guess, that reflect who they are becoming or who they will be. And so, you know, if you recall, well, those of you that are familiar with the Bible, um, whenever God did a great thing in someone's life, he changed their name. You know, Abraham's name was Abram in the beginning. And then I think like um, Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And later on, like in the New Testament, you had Saul and he became Paul. And, um, one of the disciples, Simon, was a disciple and God changed his name to Peter. So it's not uncommon uh, for people to get um, new names, you know, once they have a change in life. So I don't know if the guys are going to keep the names or use the names or, you know, if it was just symbolism. But uh, when the elders got up, you know, to give them their new name, they actually read what the meaning of the name was. And I was going to write the names down, but I think they had like African origins. And after like the first one, I couldn't understand what they were saying or figure out how to spell it. And I really didn't feel like going through the trouble of even trying to, you know, look it up and make sure I had the right names. But they were some nice names, but um, I just can't remember what they were. And so I, I like the name um, changing ceremony. I thought that was real powerful. And they even, um, even though Terrence wasn't there, they did... Um, give him a new name as well. So after the naming ceremony, um, each one of the elders, you know, gave the guys some words of wisdom. And I think um, Louis Gossett, you know, when he got up to speak, he told them that they should never give up, you know, if their goal is to reach 10 and they've only made it to five, you know, it might get hard, but they got to remember that there's still five more to go and they shouldn't give up or quit. You know, they should strive to um, make it to 10. And then even once they get to 10, add 10 more on and then, you know, always have goals in life to do better and to get higher. And then Michael Beckworth, he told them that, you know, they need to keep in mind that they were chosen to be there at that particular time 
So it was sort of like the universe had aligned to impact their lives at this particular time, in this particular moment. So don't take for granted, you know, that they were the, the people that were chosen to be in the house and that they actually made it to the end of the program. And then the other guy, you know, he told them that them being there gives them all the strength that they need. And so, you know, once again, don't take for granted what they've um, experienced and gone through over the past few days. And so, um, oh, and then remember in part two, you know, when Yala was talking, well, it might have been part one. I can't remember. I can never remember if you can't tell. <laughs> but in one of the previous episodes, Yala uh, was talking to Clarence and asked him what did he want to um, be, if he could be anything, and he wanted to be a barber. And so she did find a school in his city that was willing to offer him a full scholarship to go to barber school. And so, you know, he was really grateful for that. You know, he let Yala know that he really appreciate her, you know, taking the time out to help him fulfill his dream. So as the show closed out, you know, of course, they gave us a recap of what the guys were doing. And so, you know, like I say, Clarence got the scholarship, but as of this, um, when they called to do the checkup, he hadn't enrolled in school yet. So I really hope he will um, get it together and go ahead and get into school. And then Mike Bass, we learned, has reconnected with his kids. And so they're trying to work out, you know, to work things out so he can spend more time with the children, him and the ex-wife. But he still hasn't talked to the guys from boys to men. And then Michelangelo and um, Tyrone, you know, like I said, I don't even know why they were on the show because they really didn't have any pivotal roles or anything. But um, Michelangelo, you know, he said he's doing good and he feels stronger and more confident. And then Tyrone said that he was ready to get back into the dating game. And he's also getting ready to apply for the police academy. And then we have Mr. Kevin who had the anger issues and seemed to still have anger issues because he moved in. After the show, he moved in with his mom and his grandmother. Something jumped off and they kicked him out of the house and the mother filed a restraining order against him, you know, to keep him from coming back. So that vicious cycle is going to continue. And so we know as long as he has issues with his mom, he's probably going to have issues with the mothers of his children and he may never have a good relationship with his kids. Oh, and then I think um, Terrence, they said that Terrence said that, you know, he was happy. Him and his wife were doing great and they were happy and that although he has not met face to face with um, his daughter Lyra, that they do um, text each other. So, you know, he's another one that wasn't helped by the show at all. So like I said in the beginning, I think this may have been the last show of the season for Yala Fix My Life. Um, I didn't see any previews or anything for any upcoming shows. But um, I will be reviewing Real Housewives of Atlanta, Married to Medicine, and I also review um, Issa Rae's Insecure, which I think will be ending in a couple of weeks, as well as um, Queen Sugar, which I think has two more episodes to go, but then we'll have some more shows that are starting up. So um, I will be reviewing other things, so if you want to check out my channel, it is a view from Tracy's Point, and like I said, you know, I enjoy the comments you know when you rate the videos and if you haven't done so already i'm still trying to make it to 100 so um, if you could subscribe to the channel that'll be um appreciated as well so have a fantabulous weekend and until the next time love you all bye bye